What do you think the nonstop greed, how do you qualify what keeps them going? They have more money than they could ever possibly need to survive for generations. What makes them want more and want to keep pushing down the little guy so steadily? Well, I think you have to look at what we call ideology. We, you have to look at how people make sense of the world. And let me use as, as an example. In an unfortunate moment for him, the Republican candidate for president, Mitt Romney, was videotaped in, I believe it was Florida, giving a speech, a fundraising speech, to a group of well-heeled donors. And in the course of that, he said something that didn't help him in the presidential race any, but I think did reveal how it is the folks you're asking about see the world and how they see it in a way that enables them to simply think that it's fine for them to accumulate more and more wealth and to basically take it away from everybody else. And here's what he said. There are 47% of the people that I will never reach as a candidate because they are the moochers, the takers. They are the people who live off government handouts Whereas we, pointing to himself and to the people in the room, we are the hard workers, the productive people. We work hard not only to produce our own well-being, but we have to produce more to pay the taxes that allow those other 47% to be unproductive, to be moochers off of us. So that the world is divided into those of us who work hard and really ought to be allowed to keep more of what we have versus those who contribute little or nothing and only live of what is taken away from us. Well, with that mentality, taking things away from the mass of people, whether it be government programs or high paying jobs or helpful job benefits, all of that makes sense because you're just depriving a moocher from a portion of what he or she mooches. And you don't feel bad about that because that's just rectifying something that should never have been allowed to happen but in the first place. And at the same time, by giving yourself more, by keeping more of yourself by hiding your taxes or cutting your taxes or making more money that isn't taxed or whatever it is you're doing, you're only doing what you should have been allowed to do all along, namely keep part of the productive output you yourself have created. It is a stunning way of looking at the world that divides it into the good people and the bad people, and in such a way that the good people have every right to accumulate more and to prevent the, the bad people from snitching or snatching what they shouldn't have been given in the first place. Coming from a man whose wealth is overwhelmingly based on what he inherited from a wealthy father, it is a stunning testimony to the power of ideology, to the power of a, an idea that you would rather believe than the reality you live can come to supplant that reality so that I believe Mr. Romney and folks like him actually believe this mythology that their wealth is something they produced. Just as a historical reminder, Mitt Romney's father, George, became wealthy on the basis of an automobile company, the American Automobile Company, based in Detroit, Michigan, where that family comes from. The wealth produced in the uh, American Automobile Company was produced by tens of thousands of workers. They made the cars. George Romney didn't do that. He was an executive. But the cars were made by millions or tens of thousands of workers. So the wealth didn't come out of George Meany's cleverness or out of George Meany's hard work. Whatever cleverness he had and whatever hard work he did was done alongside of a whole lot of other people. They didn't become rich. George did, not because he was clever, but because he owned the shares and he took the bulk of the wealth. And he passed the bulk of that on to his son, who was able to use it by finding other ways to take the wealth produced by other workers. The rest is make-believe. And if there were a decent shred 
of real humanity instead of an ideology that is so blatantly self-serving, the folks like the Romneys in America would be glad to pay their fair share to help get through a crisis. And here's the irony. I believe they will, and not in the distant future, be real sorry they didn't part with part of what they accumulated because it might have been the way to save the rest of it from being drowned in a kind of devolution of the United States. We keep thinking it can't happen here. Think again. The little island of Cyprus over the last three weeks shows you how you can go from high-flying, better-than-average economic system in Europe, which Cyprus was, to a walking basket case that is looking at five to ten years minimum of economic decline something that they should recognize from their sister country, Greece, which is three or four years into that decline already. And very dangerous games are being played here, and the danger is highest for those who think they are most insulated from it. What I don't understand is, don't they think that if they cut all the money from the people who don't save money, the people who are workers that work 40, 50 hours a week, some of them having two and three jobs because they can't get a full-time job because corporations don't want to hire a lot of employees for more than a few hours because that way they don't have to pay benefits and pensions. So these people are working their tail off. They're not making a whole lot of money. Everything they earn goes into paying to survive, to pay off their bills and pay to survive and uh, for food and clothing, send their kids to school. So they don't have the extra money to spend on products. So don't they think in the top that they need to give the people on the bottom money to spend or that money doesn't get spinned around? Well, you know, you'd, you'd get an A in an economics class if I were teaching it. Uh, yes, <laughs> of course. Of course. You know, it's a very old truism. If you don't pay your workers enough, they will not be able to buy what it is your workers help to produce. You know, if a capitalist, an employer, is short-sighted and has never learned his or her economics, they think that the name of the game is to boost their profits by reducing their labor costs, either firing workers, uh, if they can afford to do that, substituting machines for workers, if they can afford to do that, paying their workers less, if they can afford to do that, etc. And they don't understand that what each capitalist does to boost his profits by cutting labor costs means that you're reducing the capacity of your future customer to buy what you produce. And you can often then find, history is full of these examples, where the gain to the employer from saving on labor was less than what the employer lost when he couldn't sell what he had paid his workers to produce because there weren't enough customers. But even though that lesson is painfully relearned, each new generation of capitalists seems to not understand that this is a problem and you can't pretend that it isn't going to bother you. Let me give you a historical example. In the early days of capitalism, three, four hundred years ago, the world was divided into what were called money lenders or bankers or creditors on the one hand and borrowers on the other. And the lenders would lend and the borrowers would borrow. But the reason the lenders lent, as you can understand, was to get the borrower to pay back not only what you lent to the borrower, but an interest payment on top of that to make money by means of lending. So then what happened when your borrower got into difficulty and informed you that he or she could not pay you the interest or maybe not even pay you all of the principal back. Outraged lenders then said, okay, if you can't, you must go to jail. And they developed things like debtor's prisons and workhouses and poor houses and threw these unfortunate borrowers into it, at which point these lenders discovered a law of economics. If a borrower is unable to pay you interest and maybe a portion of what it is you've lent him, whatever he can pay, 
whatever he has left to help at least repay part of the loan, that will not be available to you if you deprive him of his livelihood <laughs> and you throw him in a jail, you moron. Idiot. <laughs> it may give you a temporary sense of some sort of justice or it may flatter your anger or your resentment, but it isn't going to solve your problem. And after a while, guess what? They realized it's not in their interest as lenders to do anything other than work out something with the borrower that allows the borrower his or her freedom to go ahead and try to find the same job or another job to earn enough money to pay at least something toward the debt they can't honor. For me, this is a wonderful lesson, but it's the lesson your question points to. If the 1% in the United States keep on doing basically what they've done over the last 30 years, draw more and more of the income of this country into their hands, draw more and more of the wealth of this country into their hands, make life ever more difficult, more indebted, more unrewarding for the mass of people, they are, in the end, doing like the lender who threw the deficient borrower in, in the poorhouse. They are killing their own foundation of wealth. They're killing their customers. And they half know it. They keep thinking it won't matter. They will sell to the upcoming wealthy of Europe, of Asia, of China, of India. And that is part of what they're doing. They're shifting their focus, their advertising budgets to the, to the up and coming wealthy parts of the world where the factories are being moved as they're closed in the United States. But that's not a long-term strategy because in the end, the United States will still be a major consumer. And if you cripple it, it's going to have effects. But even more than that, the American people for 150 years have thought of themselves as middle class. Sure, some are richer, some are poorer, but we're all in the middle class. We all have a shot at the American dream. We all will enjoy a decent standard of living. That is now being destroyed, and it is very unclear whether the American people will accept another year or two, let alone more, of having their dreams withdrawn, having their children's lives more difficult than their own, having the possibility become further and further minuscule in a far distance. My guess is they won't. And it's going to teach a bitter lesson, just like the borrower you threw in jail finally taught the lender how stupid and self-defeating it was to imagine that you could take care only of your immediate interest and imagine that you didn't have to worry about the larger economic and political context.